Today we have a not a not a special guest, but a very special guest, Bill O'Reilly. Thank you so much, Bill, for joining us on the No BS Zone. You owe me big, Goldberg. I want those stone crabs when I come down to Florida. Listen, I know this uh, chat will cut into your nap time, so we're going to cut it. We're going to let's leave it at 20 minutes as the agreed upon time. I wish we can go more, but 20 minutes don't bloviate, Bill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got lots of questions. I'll Harry, keep it yesterday. Interesting. You said on I was on your show yesterday, and you said I was going to grill you with some uh, tough questions. Actually, I want to have a conversation with you about the state of the media today, the mainstream media. I'll ask sure. you a few inconvenient questions towards the end that you'll be able to handle with no problem at all. But basically, I want to know what you think of. The mainstream media. So let's start out with a general broad question. How would you describe mainstream, not crazy websites, but mainstream media news today? I would say that it is at the worst level of performance in the history of the country. Um, and that's because there is no drive for excellence. What the corporate media wants is money. So when you and I started out in journalism, there was a nobility, or at least they were saying there was in the college that I went to, Boston U, to uncovering the truth and bringing it to the American people so they could make decisions based upon what was real. It's gone. And you see it on every channel in every way. They play the woke game. They play the cancel culture game. They play the pandering to the audience game. They have inferior people. Mike Wallace is rolling over in his grave, to use a cliche. Um, it's really at its nadir, word of the day, Goldberg. Yeah, let me, I'll look that up later. Uh, James Bennett, who I think you know of at least, used to be the opinion editor at the New York Times. He was forced out, he, he was given a choice to resign or get fired because he had the audacity, Bill, the audacity, that's another big word, to write, to publish a column by a United States Senator, uh, Tom Cotton, Cotton from Arkansas. Cotton, right. Arkansas. Yeah, because the, the illiberal babies in the newsroom didn't like the fact that a conservative had a voice on the opinion page of the New York Times and they revolted. And then, the cowardly publisher of the New York Times, Arthur Salzberger, basically fired James Bennett. Now, yeah, Bennett is a columnist for The uh, Economist. I'm going to read you a little of what he wrote, and then I want to get your take on it. It was a smackdown, by the way, of The New York Times. He said, the Times' problem has mes met metastasized from liberal bias to illiberal bias from an inclination to favor one side of the national debate to an impulse to shut down debate altogether. He went on to say, the reality is that the Times is becoming the publication through which America's progressive elites talk to itself about an America that does not really exist. What say you, Mr. O'Reilly? Well, then it got what he deserved, number one. I don't do you feel sorry for him. He had to know he was working in a uh, snake pit because they've been doing that stuff for 20 years. New York Times attacked me viciously time and time again. I wanted to take me off the board. I did unethical things that were incredibly corrupt. Everybody who works at the New York Times knows if you don't toe their line, they're going to hurt you. So by printing an op-ed by Senator Cotton, who called for uh, federal troops to quell the riots after George Floyd, just by holding that opinion, Bennett was fired. Okay. Was I surprised he was fired? No. I was surprised that he was surprised. <laughs> you know who you're working for. You go into the New York Times, and if you're not pro-abortion, and I mean abortion without it, any limits, if you're not woke, if you're not favoring minority groups, you can't exist in that newsroom. Now, why do we care? Because the New York Times still 
has enough power that the three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, take their nightly news from what the New York Times writes. Like when you and I were working at CBS News, every morning they would have a meeting. Here's what we're gonna put on the Dan Rather show. Well, most of it came directly from the New York Times. Right, absolutely. And so they maintain, the paper maintains that kind of influence over the television news industry, not the folks. The folks get it. They know what the New York Times is. It's a left-wing journal. I once I once said that if the New York if the New York Times went on strike in the morning, the evening news wouldn't know what to put on the air. They wouldn't. All right. Wouldn't know. So here's what bothers me about at least cable news, especially cable news. It's opinion all day long masquerading as news. There's news in it, but there's opinion at the same time, and you can't have both at the same time. So if you watch Fox, for instance, you're gonna get stories about the Southern border all day long because that's what the audience wants. Right. Interrupted every few minutes by Mike Lindell and his pillow commercials. If you're watching CNN, you're not gonna get much or anything about the borders. MSNBC, the same thing. But what you will get is stories about Donald Trump's legal problems all day long. It's because okay. that's what the audience wants to hear. I think right. we're polarized enough in this country, and I think cable news polarizes polarizes us even more. I once wrote that cable news is one of the most divisive forces in all of America. Do you think I went too far by saying that? Well, it depends what period of time you're talking about. So this is a fascinating uh, discussion because in 1996, CNN was the sole purveyor of cable news. And it was back then with uh, their Bernard Shaw and, and certain people, they were presenting the news. They had a liberal slant, but it wasn't insane. Ted Turner ran it, you'll remember. Fox News comes in, Roger Ailes is the CEO and says, we're going to succeed because traditional Americans, conservative Americans, they don't have a voice. The networks and CNN, they have contempt for conservative Americans. And we're not going to do that. But we are going to give both sides of the story, which is why the O'Reilly factor became far and away the most watched cable program and remains so to this day. I think that was because I was a guest. I was a major guest on the show, but go ahead. Yeah, you were on the show and rating spike. But what I did was I insisted that we would have as many liberal voices on the factor as conservative voices. Right. And we did. And and it was so heated. Barney Frank, me and Geraldo, whatever it may be, it was so heated. It was like a boxing match and so entertaining because that kind of stuff, people who's going to win this all right and it worked but now that's gone from fox it's the talent bringing on guests who agree with the talent exactly so and because that's easier it's easier to do that for me i had to prepare I had to like get research and find out what the liberal position, where the weakness was, or if it was a crazy right winger and we brought them on too. I remember interviewing David Duke. I shredded him. I said, yeah, yeah, look, this is X, Y, and Z. That's how I got into the history thing. So cable news was much more vibrant and fair back then, all right? Because it's easy now just to talk to the choir but the choir is half what it used to be because a lot of people are bored by it. So it comes down to this is the news business and we have to give the audience what it wants. Is that what you're saying? It's even, it's even worse than that. So Fox had to pay almost a billion dollars right. because of the Dominion machine scandal. It was 780 million judgment against it. And then the legal fees and every other fee 
almost a billion dollars. That shows you how much money I made for Fox in the 20 years plus I was there, that they had this money, they could just write the check. That never would have happened had I still been on the O'Reilly factor. Because a few weeks after the vote of 2020, I said to my audience, there's no massive fraud here because there's no presentation of it to the federal court system. Judge Alito was willing to hear it. Nobody stepped up in Pennsylvania and gave him a shred of paper. So I said, they don't have it. I lost more than a thousand premium members on BillOReilly.com the day that I said that. But I had to say it. And I would have said the same thing on Fox News and I would have brought on you and I would have brought on Britt Hume and I would have brought on a bunch of the guys who really know what's going on in this country. And we would have just put it to bed right then and there. So it caught me leaving Fox News cost them a billion dollars plus all the ratings decline. And I'm not, I don't feel good about it, but it's true. All right, so let's move on. Let me ask you the first of two inconvenient questions. You're a real journalist. You've covered stories all over the place. You cover the Falklands War. I know you, you're a serious journalist, but you're also a businessman now. You're running a media business. You're in the news business as well as being a journalist. Do you ever consider what we've been talking about? Do you ever consider what your audience wants to hear? And, yeah. and do you ever? Well, the second part is, are you concerned that if you say the wrong thing, you might Never. lose customers? Never. Because really? my, audience, my audience knows me. And the people who have come on to BillOReilly.com, which is where we live, they know that I'm just going to give it to them straight. The way I see it, and I'm going to back up every blank and word I say, Goldberg. Every word I say, I'm going to back it up. I did something tonight on the No Spin News that's going to anger some of the audience. I said that the Pope blessing same-sex unions wasn't bad. It's a benevolent action. Now, I know there are going to be a lot of conservative Catholics and Christians who say, well, oh, no, you can't do that. And, but I explain it right down to the T. My audience is smart enough, sophisticated enough, and honest enough to accept that, even though they might not like it. And then they can write me a letter. I'll read the letter. We'll kick it around. Those are the kind of people that I'm recruiting for my news organization. Well, let me tell you something, Bill. That is not the audience for cable news today, but we both know that. So let me move on to the second inconvenient and final inconvenient question. One of our subscribers, a guy named Dave, I don't know Dave personally, seems like a bright guy when he writes. He wrote to me saying he was looking forward to hearing you today, but that he thought you had become his words, as Mike Wallace once said to the Ayatollah, don't blame me, not my words. He said he thought you had become an apologist for Donald Trump. An and apologist for Donald Trump. That's, that's right. what, he's not the only one who thinks that, and you know that, Bill. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I think it's a valid opinion for them to hold because I'm not hostile to Donald Trump. However, I don't apologize for anything he says. And when he says something dopey, I point it out. And I can prove it by the United States of Trump. Do you read that book? That's not a kiss up book. And you know, I bet you your letter writer didn't read it. And I stay away from the Nazi stuff, from this and that. And let me tell you why. I've known the man for more than three decades. What he says changes from hour to hour. From minute to minute. Okay. Right. He, it's like a stream of consciousness. It's like a political Tourette syndrome. <laughs> Whatever pops into his mind, he says. No sense, sir. Okay. And the reason for that is he's a rich guy and his whole life, He's been able to say whatever he wanted to say because he had all his money and 
So what? You don't like it. <laughs> so what he says, unless it's hurting the individual American, I ignore what he did in four years as president was good for the country in my assessment. And I can run down the list. It was good for the country. It's just his verbiage and his demeanor from day to day that upsets a lot of people. But it doesn't upset me because I think it's meaningless. Does that make any sense? Well, um, it, it does, but I told you a long time ago, and I think I told you in a public manner on TV, <clears throat> that a journalist can't be friends, can't cover a friend. Uh, now, Donald Trump was running for president when you were on Fox. You couldn't ignore him, obviously. But whether you were friends or not, and, I, and I, my guess is Donald Trump doesn't have any real friends, but whether you were friends or not, you went to ball games with them, you were pals. And I have the suspicion, Bill, that if you weren't socially connected to Donald Trump, at least in a matter of going to ball games and stuff, you might have treated him differently on the air. You might have not ignored certain things. Is that a fair statement? No, I, it's a fair statement, but I, I disagree with it because the toughest interviews Donald Trump has ever done have been with me. And you can Google him. I mean, I took him apart for John McCain. Took him apart. So, yeah, I'm friends with him. I'm not buddies. I mean, it's not, you know, but cordial. Um, but you ask any of my friends, if they do something dopey, <laughs> I'm on them. I, I'm, I'm not. So I never saw a problem with that. And when I analyze what he did as president, it was pretty good. It was better than Barack Obama, and it's light years better than Joe Biden. So faced with a choice of a guy who's a loose cannon verbally, but governed pretty well, and Joe Biden, you know where I'm going. All right, I, I know we don't have much time, so I'm gonna end, I'd like to end anyway with a few questions that have nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with the American culture, something I wanted to do with you and take the show on the road. And I never heard back, so I guess you didn't like the idea. But I'm gonna ask you a few questions from Marcel Proust's questionnaire. Marcel Proust was a writer, you probably never heard of him, Bill. Was a writer no, in I the- know what, I know what it is, Goldberg. It's one sentence answers, right? It lit no more than one sentence. Okay, I'm Marcel ready. Proust did this as a as a, a thing in his living room with his friends, and I'm going to do it with you, and we'll end it at that. What trait do you most deplore in others? Arrogance, and that's interesting coming from me, but I have a sense of humor, and that takes the edge off. But I don't like entitled, arrogant people. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself, Bill? Lack of patience. Got me in a lot of trouble. I gotta be more patient. All right. Which living person do you most admire? Which president besides, is that? Besides me, besides me. Okay, just state the question again. I get a little fog in my earpiece here. Which what? Which living person do you most admire? Living person. Um, boy, that's a real, real tough one. Um, which living person do I most we, admire? We can come back to this if you want. Let's, yeah, let's, let me think about that for a minute. I don't want to be glib about that. I have, a, I have a feeling you're going to say, I don't despise anyone, but which living person do you most despise? Oh, uh, the head, uh, no, George Soros, George Soros, would he be the guy? He's done so much damage to America. I, it's incalculable how much damage he's done. What is the quality you most like in a man? Uh, honesty, just tell me the truth. I don't want any subtext. 
Very few, just a couple more, and we'll say thank you and goodbye. Sure. If you sure. could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Um, I think that I would probably change my judgmental attitude a little bit, a little bit. Oh, that's, it, that's, you, know, you know, I'm a little old school in that way. and probably could moderate that a little bit. <laughs> you're revealing a lot. I appreciate that. Just three more. What do you most value in your friends? In my friends? Yeah. Loyalty. They got to check in. They got to they got to be involved. You know, I'm a good friend and I expect that coming back to me. You you've been good to me over the years and I hope you think I've repaid the favor in some way. Absolutely. I wouldn't be doing this if you weren't. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Which historical figure do you most identify with? You've written a lot of history about history. Yeah. You must have at least one historical figure that you identify with. I would say Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy and I are like uh, very similar. Well, you, in went the way to, we, you went to high school together, as I recall. I think so. Yeah, he was. I think he was a senior when I was a freshman at Chaminade. But I lived 10, 10 uh, miles from him. You know, he lived in Oyster Bay. And, you know, Teddy wanted to live a robust life. And I, I have lived that. And I saw it would be Teddy. Who are your heroes in real life? Heroes? In real life. You know, I like the people who uh, devote their lives uh, to teaching the underprivileged. I was a high school teacher and I taught tough kids, poor kids. And there are and I didn't I did it two years and then I became a journalist. But there are people who devoted their lives to going into these uh, very poor neighborhoods, poor schools, teaching these kids, don't make a lot of money. They do it because they want to help the kids. No, no more noble profession, in my opinion. What I admire about you, Bill, is your intelligence. And I'm, I know it sounds corny, and, and I shouldn't say this publicly, but your intelligence and your sense of humor. Uh, I enjoy talking to you. I enjoy you talking to me and being on your shows from time to time. And I appreciate you, you for being on the no bs zone today thank you very much well i just want to say one thing you know the reason that i uh have associated with you for many many years is because of your book bias and and i was at cbs when bernie goldberg was their top correspondent nobody got more airtime than goldberg he was all over the place I didn't fare that well at a CBS News National because I didn't play the game that you had to play. And I didn't want to play it. And it was a corrupt game. And I wrote about that in uh, my book, A Bold Fresh Piece of Humanity, and in my first novel, my only novel, um, Those Who Trespass. But anyway. Let me, let, um, me, let me just jump in for a second. That novel is a fantastic read. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Fun and I write it. asked you privately, and I won't reveal anything. I said, is this person so-and-so? Because I yeah. know the real people. I mean, hey, look, it was, it was so it, the guy on Martha's Vineyard who yeah, got yeah. waxed. Yeah. You I know him know really him. well. <laughs> I know him. I you know him. He's a real person. Yeah. But anyway, so Goldberg writes a book, and it's dead on bias it's just absolutely every page is true and i went whoa because most people comfortable at cbs and you know they're in the hierarchy they never would have done that and so we started associations work very well and i'll come back on your podcast you know let's we'll probably do it uh, maybe in may or something when the presidential thing shakes up a little bit we really know but i i want to tell everybody that listening to bernie goldberg is uh, worthwhile and thanks for having me on and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much myself, Bill. And I appreciate that. And now you can go back and take your nap. Thanks for the nap. Yes, after that, I need the nap. See you, Bernie. Bye-bye. <laughs>